Today I'm um, going to be coming out of Psalm 141, if you like to turn on me in your Bibles. Um, I apologize, I haven't really been doing this as much. I've been kind of unraveling um, each passage uh, and each message recently, but I want to go ahead and read this one first before we, uh, before we work through it. So we're looking at Psalm 141, Psalm of David. <clears throat> I call to you, Lord, come quickly to me. Hear me when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it for my prayer will still be against the deeds of evildoers. Their rulers will be thrown down from the cliffs, and the wicked will learn that my words were well spoken. They will say, as one plows and breaks up the earth, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. But my eyes are fixed on you, sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. Keep me safe from the traps set by evildoers, from the snares they have laid for me. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by. And safety. Word of the Lord. Um, so today's message is the fourth part of a five-part series. Uh, uh, I won't be preaching on the Psalms next week, but the week after I'll be finishing up with Psalm 91. Um, each Sunday I've been trying to feature some different types of Psalms, all of which uh, were written by David. That wasn't really on purpose, so that's just kind of the way it worked out, but I'm not upset about that. Uh, My basis for choosing each psalm has uh, been the structure of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Luke 11, we read, One day Jesus was praying at a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus responded by saying, "When uh, When you pray, say, Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, You'll see on the list here, this is kind of where we've been. And today we're looking at uh, lead us not into into temptation. And we'll we'll cross over a little bit into deliver us from evil as well in this psalm. Um, My goal for this series has been, um, or for this message and for previous messages, that we would look to the book of Psalms as a source of wisdom and strength and inspiration for our own daily prayer life, um, that we would allow these songs, these prayers, these poems from 2,500 to 3,500 years ago uh, allow us to see a window into the past and, and to see how God's faithful people prayed back then and in turn show us how we can pray uh, openly or candidly to the Lord today, um, expressing our own deepest feelings and longings and concerns and struggles, but also our praise, our gratitude, our adoration, and so on. Um, that we would incorporate the Psalms into our daily prayer life, and that if we haven't already, that we would begin to catalog them for our own use and benefit uh, during different times and situations of our lives. <coughs> um. <laughs> Sorry, Dana, it's all right. <laughs> um. Within the Psalms, we've talked about some of the different uh, genres in the books of the Bible, and within the Psalms, there are some subgenres as well. Um, and you'll see uh, some of those listed on the, on the slide. You've got Psalms of joy and delight and thanksgiving, songs, Psalms of trust and faith and confidence, and so on. Um, and Psalm 41, as, as with many other Psalms, it includes at least a few different subgenres. They're not uh, usually um, streamlined enough to only have one. Uh, uh, but in this case, there, there are some other uh, themes as well throughout the psalm. But I believe the main theme for this psalm uh, to be a- David's urgent need and desire and request, not only for the Lord's protection, but also that he would keep David holy and steadfast, uh, steadfast on the path of righteousness, even in the midst of some very intense evil, evil doers and danger and opposition. We don't know the exact occasion that inspired David to write this psalm, What we do know is that he found himself in the midst of some pretty despicable and unfavorable company. 
Uh, perhaps a quick look back to Psalm 140, which uh, seems to be related, will shed even more light on these folks. <clears throat> In verse 1 we read, uh, David says, Rescue me, Lord, from, the evil, from evil doers. Protect me from the violent who devise evil plans in their hearts and stir up war every day. They make their tongues as sharp as serpents. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Keep me safe, Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from the violent who devise ways to trip up my feet. The arrogant have hidden a snare for me. They have spread out their cords, spread out the cords of their net, and have set up traps for me along my path. Now, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I would venture to say that some, if not all of the folks that David is talking about, uh, are probably in close proximity to him each day as he writes this psalm. Perhaps they're members of his, his council who want to deceive him or get rid of him. Perhaps some consider themselves to be his friends and allies. Perhaps some are even members of his own family. Have you ever found yourselves in a place or a situation like this before yourselves? When the ones who at least on paper are supposed to be in your corner turn out to be the ones who want to destroy you and to see you fail. Can any of you guys relate to that? Have you experienced that? Maybe you've encountered or, an, or are encountering something like this in your life uh, right now in your workplace, uh, your school, a group or committee that you're in, uh, and so on. What can we do and how should we respond at times like this when the threat of danger and wickedness um, and deceit is imminent? How might we pray at times like this? How can we remain holy and set apart for the Lord in times like this? Let us explore Psalm 141 and see and learn how David prayed at a time like this. <clears throat> in verse 1, he says, I call to you, Lord. Come to me quickly. Hear me when I call to you. Um, you will find that in this psalm and in other psalms, David's not afraid uh, to drop a dime, as they say, and call the Lord nor is he afraid to request, request the Lord's help immediately. Um, there's a true sense of urgency and distress in this psalm. He says, Lord, I need you now. Please come to me quickly. Make haste. Now, granted, we always desire for the Lord to be with us uh, in whatever situation we're in, and, and, we, and we, we know that he is, but there are some times when we really, really need the Lord. Uh, we need him more than ever, and we want to know that he is there with us. We want to feel that uh, somehow or another especially when situations are dire and scary and uncertain. Uh, it's a desperation, even, for us. Have you ever called 911 before? Anybody? Yeah? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, people don't usually call 911 because they, they just broke a nail in their finger. Usually they actually broke their finger or fingers, or maybe even have a, had a finger cut off. Um, it's usually a pretty, uh, a pretty serious situation. And it's not that you don't ever need or want any kind of medical attention otherwise, um, that you don't call 911. It's just that you need it at that point really urgently and quickly. Um, and it's the same idea applies for calling the police and the fire department. Um, sometimes we have 911 prayers too, and usually uh, when things are dire like that, 911 Calls and prayers start to coincide for believers. Uh, they happen at the same time. Uh, we've seen some of this lately, uh, situations with Jim and Anna and Jacob, who we've been praying for. These are some pretty intense situations where uh, people did have to have the ambulance called and uh, were in the ER or, or the intensive care unit uh, fighting for their lives, uh, in, in at least that one case. So, um, so I'm not certain if you've ever had a call 911 before. Uh, and to be honest, I couldn't recall a time where I've, I have ever called 911 before a couple months ago. And uh, it's a really interesting story, and it, it never saw it coming. But um, I'm not going to go into the whole backstory. But Caleb and I were basically trying to help someone out, and we find ourselves we find ourselves entering uh, into the lobby of a, a local hotel. And before the, the door could even close, there, we noticed that there was a huge altercation going on between a man and a woman. They were both belligerent. Uh, pretty strong uh, likelihood of them being under the influence of drugs and or alcohol. Um, there was a lot of yelling and cursing and insulting each other going on. They were in each other's faces. And at that point, there was really no turning back. Uh, and I came come in before Caleb, and I found myself uh, almost at the desk, and they were right beside me. And uh, you couldn't just walk right back out. I was now a part of this situation. 
um, I was I was bound to it, and I started to, um, you know, kind of observe and, and see what was happening here. What can I do to prevent the situation from getting worse? How can I resolve it? And um, you know, I found myself uh, asking the man to just calm down and to just go outside and separate himself from the situation. I tried to get myself my body in between the two of them because you could tell they didn't have much qualms about uh, laying hands on each other, and not the kind of prayer hands we like to talk about before in church. There are some, some violent hands uh, coming down on each other there. <laughs> um, and, I, and, you know, just like that. Uh, well, in these moments, you know, things happen so fast, you don't have time to pray a verbal prayer. It's just a quick prayer in your head, like sometimes not even words. It's just like, Lord, it's just a... Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's an unspoken uh, prayer, I guess, and you're just saying, Lord, please help, please help, please help, what do I do here, you know? It's like hit the panic button, what am I going to do with this? And uh, it was messy. And just like that, the man uh, got between, and the man started backing up and going back to the door, and I was like, whew, thank you, Lord. I was like, just like that, the Lord has answered the prayer, but I spoke too fast, because the man, when he got to the door, he held the door open, and he, then he just sat there insulting the lady from the door, uh, and when he was done, she took her turn coming back at him, and they're going back and forth, and then he starts moving in towards her, and they were, you know, pushing on each other. Um, now, you, you say, you know, man should never touch a woman. Her, I totally agree. But this woman was different. She, uh, <laughs> she, was, she, she was not afraid to fight this guy. And uh, at one point, there was this uh, empty, it was like a two-gallon bottle of some kind of cleaning solution. It was about half empty, and she took this bottle and slammed it right in the guy's face. And I was like, my Lord. Um, the whole situation was shocking, and uh, it got to the point where I tried to intervene. I tried to separate them, and there was just no stopping them. I, and I could tell this wasn't the first, and it certainly wouldn't be the last time. It was a a true love-hate relationship, that, and they were probably going to go at it again at some point in the future. And, I, and Caleb and I kind of looked at each other, and I think we knew, like, there's no, there's no resolving this. So I gave up. I went on outside, and uh, I could tell the, the, uh, the guy at the desk was, you know, just disgusted and terrified, and he had already, I thought he had already started calling the police, and I went ahead and called the police as well, because I was like, I don't know if they're going to kill each other. I was concerned for our safety. I don't know if they got a knife, a gun they're going to pull on me if I try to physically intervene. But I, anyway, it's a crazy story. But I, use, I, I speak about that story just because it talks about the urgency uh, of our prayer sometimes and how fast things happen. And we're just like, Lord, what just happened? I need you now. <laughs> or like Alvin said yesterday, Lord, did you see that? Did you see that? And it gives us, you know, sometimes you don't really have that much time to, to, say, to ask that question. Uh, but just that sense of urgency. But also for me, I was concerned for our safety. I was concerned for Caleb and I. I didn't know what they were going to do, what they were capable of. There were a lot of wires, you know. Um, I was also uh, concerned about what am I going to do if I have to intervene and like, you know, try to restrain this guy or fight this guy. Am I going to get angry and am I going to get pulled into this behavior as well? I don't know. Uh, so I'm praying for all those things without words. Uh, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, when things get hot, we call on the Lord and we ask him to respond quickly. And um, <laughs> I digress, sorry. Yeah, just kind of an uh, illustration of how fast things can happen and how much we need the Lord in, in those times and situations uh, for resolution if, they're, if it's even a possibility. So, uh, Moving on to verse 2. <laughs> may my prayer be set before you, David asks, like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. And David was a faithful man of God. He hoped that his prayer would go up before the Lord like incense from the tabernacle or the evening sacrifice, a holy and uh, pleasing aroma for the Lord. Um, David considered his prayer to be a spiritual sacrifice that he was offering up to the Lord. And you might consider that to be a little arrogant. You know, sometimes if you listen to David in the Psalms, you're like, man, that's kind of bold, David. I don't know if I would ask like that. Uh, but David was bold in his prayers. And he wasn't arrogant because uh, the prayers of God's children are precious to the Lord. Um, they matter to him. A faithful child of God with a pure heart, um, a humble heart, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, a desire for a closeness with the Lord. His or her prayers are heard by the Lord. He, um, in Psalm 34, uh, some, some of that uh, we read, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. 
Um, and just after, it says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. And of course, we know that part of that there is messianic, but um, <clears throat> that should just show you how much the Lord loves you and how concerned he is for you. He hears your prayers. He sees you. He knows you. And it, it's not an arrogant thing to expect the Lord to, to look out for you and to, to guide you and protect you. So be bold in your prayers. Don't be afraid to pray those bold prayers like David did. <clears throat> David's prayer showed his complete trust and dependency. And remember, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Remember the song today? David's prayer showed his complete dependency and trust on the Lord for all things, um, rather than relying on his own strength and his own ability. Now, David was a strong man, remember? This guy was a warrior. Uh, what was the saying? Uh, Saul's killed a thousand, but David's killed tens and tens of thousands, right? Something like that. Uh, David was a man amongst men, and yet he still recognized, he was wise enough to recognize that he needed the Lord desperately. <clears throat> Did we also see this in the Lord Jesus Christ as well? You're talking about the Son of God now, even far greater man than David. Uh, Hebrews 5, 7 through 10, we read, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Um, let this kind of faith and trust be an example and an inspiration for us today as well. Don't hesitate to pray to the Lord and know that he hears you and cares for you. David said in verse 3, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And it's funny, when I thought about this verse a little bit, I thought about how some of you here today probably wish you could put a guard over the lips of a lot of other people that you know. <laughs> Maybe myself, too, a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> um. <coughs> uh, nonetheless, I'm asking you to think about yourselves here today to be introspective and not think about all the other people's lips and mouths who you wish God would close. But to think about yourself here. Um, David knew that his dealings and his conversations with these people might also uh, tempt him or compel him to speak wickedly. And I talked about that example earlier. I didn't know if I was going to get roped into something and some old behaviors. You know, some of us talk about the, the turn back to the old me, all the, the flip the switch, go back to the old you for a second. And I was, you know, you get those concerns sometimes that that might happen to you. Um, and David knew that was a possibility for him. It could happen. It could compel him to speak wickedly and therefore... He prayed that the Lord would set a guard over his mouth and that we keep, he would keep watch over the door of his lips. Um, and many of us uh, should have this concern also, how easy it could be when you're around certain people in certain environments that have no qualms about you know, cussing, using the Lord's name in vain, and gossiping and insulting people and so on. It could be really easy to do when there's no church folk around to keep you honest and uh, to convict you, to deter you. Um, but we should always remember, and we talked about this a bit yesterday at the men's breakfast as well, the Lord, uh, the Lord sees you. He knows you. Uh, he knows your deeds. Um, if you believe that he hears your prayers, then you should also believe uh, and trust that he hears those words that you speak, uh, those idle words, those uh, wicked words that you speak as well. He hears them all, the good and the bad. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18 through 19, he said, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defiled him. And he was, uh, of course, talking to the, uh, the Pharisees here. He says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Um, you might recall David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, so the good things come out. Um, James, in his letter, has a lot to say about things that come out of a person's mouth. Uh, in chapter 1, especially chapter 3, I'm going to read a, a few of those verses today. If I'm going to give you some homework today, uh, I'm going to read the longer passage of James 3, but it's just to read the book of James. You know, that's your homework for today if you want to do it. Uh, he says, James says in uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And this uh, kind of reflects back on what Pastor Alvin was saying yesterday. And we were talking about, you know, uh, Francis was talking about somebody cuts you off on the road or you know, cuts in front of you in line or in the store or wherever, and that first impulse is you're angry. 
and you want to you want to say something, you want to do something about it. And uh, Al was talking about he's gotten trying to get himself in the habit or has been in the habit where he says, "God, did you see that?" <laughs> and it gives you at least a second or two to think about how you're going to respond before you respond and uh, before your flesh tries to tries to take that response over from you. Um, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. He says in uh, James 1.26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but dis, uh, uh, does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, that person's religious, or I'm sorry, religion is worthless. Uh, basically, everything else you do is worthless if you can't uh, find a way to bridle your tongue or tame your tongue or keep it under control. Um, and then he says in James 3, talking a little bit more about taming the tongue, he says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Woo! <laughs> and he keeps on going. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, hear this, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape, grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. These two things are inconsistent. If we are truly uh, sons and daughters of the Lord, we got to learn to tame our tongues and, and keep it under control. Uh, Peter says in 1 per, uh, Peter 3.10, he says, Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as, it, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Um, so it's, it's turning this, this idea on, it, on its head. It's um, turning corrupt and evil talk into encouraging uh, and, and blessing and, and, and letting good things pour out of a heart of love uh, and, a, and a, uh, living by the Spirit and not the flesh. Um, so let us also be our prayer, uh, let it be our prayer today as it was for David, that the Lord would set a guard over our mouths and that only good words would escape our lips, not foolish and hateful and bitter and deceitful words. <clears throat> he says in verse 40, not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. And just as David prayed that the Lord would set a guard over his mouth and that sinful words would not leave it, he also prays that the Lord would guard his heart so that he would not take part in wicked deeds. This is um, a similar concept here. We live in a, in a fallen world that lives for the desires and the cravings of the flesh. You just look around you and you can see that. Look at the advertisements that you see uh, pretty much on anywhere you go. Many of them express, uh, or none of them express any concern over your spiritual life. Of your or your knowledge of the Lord, you might catch one occasionally, but pretty rare. That's ever going to happen. They're always promoting greed and selfishness and gluttony and greed and lust and comfort and convenience and entertainment. They're telling you that um, those are the paths of happiness and contentment. And that they are uh, really what they're doing is selling you fool's gold. Many of us has, have also sought out this fool's gold in the past, and sometimes we might even still catch ourselves going back to the old mine again for the fool's gold. Don't search for the joy and contentment there. That old mind and path only leads to destruction. Uh, we know the way, the truth, the life comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it comes through him alone. He is where we find our hope, our joyce. Uh, <laughs> joyce. That's a good way of mixing joy and peace together. He's our joyce. Maybe that's how they got that name. Sorry. Joy, peace, contentment. He is where we find true salvation and holiness and the hope of eternal life, the things that the world cannot offer us. 
David says in verse 5, Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it, for my prayer will still be against the deeds of evildoers. <laughs> I love this uh, proverb I came across in Proverbs 12. One. It says, um, I think it's NIV. I'm not sure what the others say, but it says, uh, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. <laughs> I was like, okay, not really uh, mincing words there, are we? Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. <laughs> uh, Proverbs says a lot about uh, wisdom and foolishness. It's a great book for anyone to read, especially kids, you know. I should force my kids to read that today and see if, see if it rubs off. Proverbs uh, 3:11 through 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's wisdom or be wary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Uh, Revelation 3.19, uh, the, the Lord says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Um, David says, If I will be struck or rebuked, let it be, by, let it be a righteous man who does it. Let, him, let that be the one who rebukes me. And this, of course, shows David's humility, and it shows ours as well, when we are willing to accept uh, rebuke, re- <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, uh, um, and, and to take it constructively and to not get upset and get all sensitive. And that's, a, that's something uh, to be introspective about as well. You know, I think a lot of times our first reaction when somebody wants to rebuke us is like, who do they think they are, right? They don't have any right to say those things to me. But, you know, if you take that second to pause and to consider what they've had to say uh, and kind of get over the pride, you might, you might be able to see... Um, the blessing that, that is going to come from their rebukes and, and how you can learn uh, and move forward in a more positive way out of that and, and to grow in your spiritual walk. Um, David says, help me to grow. Help me to learn, Lord. Teach me wisdom and righteousness. That was always one of David's uh, main concerns in life. <clears throat> David yet still, even after being rebuked and disciplined, says he will pray for the righteous uh, pray for righteousness and against lawlessness and against evildoers who defy and reject the ways of the Lord. He's not going to be deterred by rebuke. Uh, in fact, he's going to, he encourages it, he accepts it, and he's going to continue on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, he's going to continue to pray against lawlessness and evildoers. Um, he's not going to be swayed. He's not going to be deterred by those things, by the rebuke of a righteous man. Let us not be um, deterred by that either. Sometimes we have to be that person who rebukes ourselves, and that's not a comfortable place to be. It's not really comfortable receiving it or uh, rebuking others. And James, once again, in 5, 19 to, uh, chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from, from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And uh, Proverbs 27, we read, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, and I'd like to interject. So one godly person sharpens another, a person with godly knowledge and wisdom uh, that can give a, a righteous rebuke. That person can sharpen another believer as well. Verse 6, we read, The rulers will be thrown down from the cliffs, and the wicked will learn that my words were well spoken. They will say, As one plows and breaks up the earth, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. And going back to Proverbs again, uh, this is a very popular verse here. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And, uh, of course, uh, I, I would imagine that David, at some point or another, he probably spoke candidly to some of these people who he felt were, were so against him and who wanted to destroy him. Uh, perhaps David even tried to say words to, to help them repent and to turn away from their wickedness. Um, and you may have tried as well. You may have tried to share the gospel. You may have tried to um, share righteousness as you know it is um, in God's word with other people, and they've either scoffed at it or laughed at you or rejected it. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What fools despise wisdom and instruction. Sometimes there's nothing you can do no matter how hard you try. <clears throat> David, in this case, he said... Um, he searches for vindication in this psalm here. He's looking for vindication. He says, um, the rulers will be thrown down to the cliffs. There will be 
um, justification as well and vindication. The wicked will learn that, that my words were well spoken, that what he said was true, that the word of the Lord was true after all. Um, <coughs> Philippians 2, 9 through 10. Um, Therefore God exalted him, uh, speaking of Christ, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, and essentially I think what David is saying is one way or another, sooner or later, they are going to, to recognize the truth that I have spoke to them. And perhaps you might uh, be in the same boat if you've tried to help to rebuke or to turn a person away from their sin. They are going to, they're going to remember the words that you spoke. And they're going to say, your words were well spoken. Uh, hopefully it's not too late and the Lord is patient with them. They will say, as one plows and breaks up the other, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. They've been rejected. They've been um, left out. And it could be too late at that point at the judgment. Uh, it's too late to turn back. <clears throat> David says in verse 8, My eyes are fixed on you, sovereign Lord, and you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. Keep me safe from the traps set by evildoers, from the snares that they have laid for me. Let the wicked fall into their own nets. Will I pass by in safety? <clears throat> and we talk about it all the time, say on the, the straight and narrow. That's one of those sayings that you hear all the time. Um, but it's the narrow path and the small gate that leads to eternity. The faithful saints will stay on the, the narrow path and pass through the, the small gate. So the world walks on the, the wide path of destruction. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for, the, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few will find it. We know in the last days, and even up, through, up till now, um, it's not always going to be easy as a believer. There's going to be persecution, perhaps even death for the faithful. But the Lord is our hiding place, the one who protects us and sustains us each day. He gives us um, each day our daily bread as we read in the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> we pray for his blessing. We, play, we pray for his protection um, each day that he would give us life abundant, and that our lives would bring honor and glory to his name. But whether we live or die, we belong to him and we live for him. And nothing in this world can take away our salvation. It's um, an inheritance, eternal inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. He knows the number of our days. What we will do for all, the, uh, for all time is laid out before him. This doesn't mean that we live without free will or moral accountability. Um, his foreknowledge and sovereignty does not make us mindless puppets. Yet he still knows our thoughts, our desires, and our deeds, past, present, and future. Let us pray for him to keep us safe from the traps of sin and temptation and, and of danger, threats that lead to physical death and spiritual death and separation from the Lord. <clears throat> we read a little bit from the book of Ephesians yesterday, um, and I'm going to begin to close <laughs> with, a, with a passage from there and maybe, and maybe another. Um, Paul said in Ephesians 4, uh, this is, he's given in uh, the application part of this letter. How do we respond to all these things, that the, these great things that the Lord has done? He's lavished his grace upon us. He says uh, in Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You might recall a couple of weeks ago, we, we read through Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 uh, three says, He guides me on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let him also guide us for his name's sake, but also for our own sake and for the sake of all who are watching and observing our, our Christian walk. Let us be good examples of Christ's likeness to them 
so that they see something different about us than what they see in the world, a love, a hope, a joy, a peace that they have not and cannot find in this world. <clears throat> it's, 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 a, it's a verse I, I think about a lot and I, and I can't forget. Um, in Romans 2, uh, 24, we just read through Romans on uh, last Monday, but it says, Paul told the Jews, God's name is blaspheme among the Gentiles because of you, because of their hypocrisy. There are people that are blaspheming the name of God. They don't, they're not seeing people practice what they preach and not live out the way uh, that they know that they're uh, supposed to live. <coughs> Let, us not, let that not be the case for us here today. Let us be uh, true believers, ones who um, have taken off the old self and put on the new self in Christ, who, who don't run back to that old way when things get hard, when things get stressful, um, when things get ugly. Uh, and that was David's prayer. David was ultimately praying for holiness and that he would remain set apart for the Lord during this time. That was, that was the main uh, thing he was, he was asked for. And, of course, the Lord's protection as well. But he wanted to remain holy unto the Lord uh, in the midst of these evil doers and these evil things and deeds and words and all the things that were going around him. And that's the same prayer for, I think, many of us today uh, in the environments where we find ourselves each day, whether it's at work or um, school or uh, whatever the case. <clears throat> David was an example in prayer, and we know that Christ is a perfect example of that as well. Um, much as I want to, I'm not going to read it, but if I could give you another, Psalm 22. Christ um, is basically in this psalm. It's a messianic psalm. He's talking about, um, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He can't feel the Lord's presence there with him. But we know um, that the Lord was there, that the Lord saw, and he was vindicated. And um, we know that, the, that God can and will save us from evil and sin and death even when we don't feel it. We know that Christ is victorious um, in the end. <coughs> Sorry, I'm gonna... I lied. I'm going to read the last part of this here. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies for uh, selling you like that. But <clears throat> In Psalm 22, we read, For he, is the not he has not despised or scorned the suffering or the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from them, but he has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. <clears throat> May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who will go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And what a blessing it is for us today to, to hold on to that promise and 